Hello, everybody. Good to see you on tonight. We've got a good, quick lesson. Quick and that it's got a lot of information. So uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, thank him for a beautiful week. Your Google Assistant isn't set up yet. To get started, open. Well, I just got Google, Google Assistant, Assistant telling me I'm not set up yet. So <laughs> we're going to get started and we're going to have a good lesson. Hi, Cindy. Uh, and, and Nancy and Ed, Richard, good seeing you guys. Be praying for uh, Becky. Um, Kelker, she is going to start her trek northward to be visiting everybody. And uh, she's going to be stopping by us at the end of the month. So be praying that she has a safe trip this time. Because last time, if we remember, she didn't quite make it around. So let's pray for Becky and, and uh, our country and for uh, Sue's sister who's in recovery. Uh, she had uh, cancer surgery. Let's be praying for Steve. Um, Oh, Ed, no, not by Uber. Uh, let's be praying for Steve, who's recovering, and Kay, who's recovering. We got a lot of things going on health-wise with people, and we want to make sure that they're they're doing well. So let's pray that the mercy of the Lord and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ covers them. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for your grace. Father, we live under the favor of heaven. Father, in your mercy just overtakes us, Lord God, because it's who you are. Father, and we thank you for it. We thank you for teaching us tonight your word. Thank you for opening up revelation to us in great, mighty ways. Father, let us understand your word more so that we can draw deeper and deeper and deeper into what we ought to be and what our potential really is in Christ. Father, we pray for all these that we mentioned tonight that are uh, recovering from illnesses and, and procedures and Father, we pray for them that in the name of the Lord Jesus, there would be a supernatural surge of energy go through their being, Lord God, that they would recover supernaturally because your word, Father, pronounces over them that by the stripes of Jesus, they were already healed. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your grace upon your people and the lesson you're teaching us tonight. Father, and we pray, Lord God, for Becky Kelker. She makes her way from Mexico to uh, dip all over in, in the states here, Father, bless her, bless her abundantly, Lord God, and put angels around her to keep her safe. We thank you for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, let's get started because we got a lot of ground to cover and we have some really, really interesting things here uh, that I think um, you guys are going to grab hold of. Uh, we're going to go back to Abraham and I want to talk uh, for a minute. Just kind of how Abraham was or how he operated, what he believed. Um, then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and take the possessions for yourself. But Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand to the Lord, the God most high or the most high God, creator of heaven and earth, and vow that I will not, that I will take nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal which is interesting because he, the word says that uh, John the Baptist said, even a sandal strap, I'm not worthy to unloosen when he's talking about uh, Jesus. So that way you can never say, it is I who made Abram rich. Now, here's a picture of Jesus with Lucifer on the top of the temple, observing the riches of the earth. His response is the same as Abram's. It's God alone who provides my wealth. And, and I think, this is one of the things that makes Abram so um, so interesting of a person because the parallels that he has with Jesus and the way he operated, some of the things he says are just amazing. And in this case here, we, we see the same temptation. This should also teach us a lot about what Jesus says about how we ought to handle ourselves and conduct ourselves through life. You see, because with, um, with the devil, he always operates with the same modus operandi. People well, all the time, they'll, they'll say, well, you can never tell how the devil's going to. No, you can tell exactly what the devil's going to do. And be honest with you, you can tell exactly what God's going to do. 
It's like when people talk about interpreting scripture. Scripture always interprets scripture. You don't have to have somebody else interpreting scripture. I mean, if somebody says, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, you have to go here or there to interpret. No, you don't. You, you can you can look at scripture and you can find the answers you're looking for, because if you need an interpretation for something in the New Testament, go back and find where it's related in the Old Testament, because everything in the new will be explained fully in the old only by types and shadows. But it's explainable. Yet, Richard, you're right. He's only a counterfeiter. And, and he doesn't have any, have any power of creation. He, he can't. But all he can do is take what is here, already present, and pervert it. And that's what he's done uh, the whole of his career as a supervillain. So we, we see here how Abram dispatches the king of Sodom. Now, obviously, Sodom was not a good place. It, and in, in that it was not a good place. We have the understanding that the king of Sodom would certainly represent the devil in this uh, point, making a temptation to Abraham. And and Abraham says, you know, I'm not I'm not going to take anything. From you. You're, you're not going to make me wealthy. I, I vowed to the Lord. I'm not taking anything so that anybody can say they did anything for me. And, and that's, I think, a good way for us to live our life. Now, in Genesis 15, 1, it says, after these things, so that's after all the, um, yeah, had he, the devil is a squatter. Uh, after all the things that Abraham went through as going out. Now, we talked about this last week. Abraham goes out. He's got his trained servants, but he, but he doesn't have anybody else. He doesn't have trained warriors. He's got trained worshipers. That's what he's got. He's got sheep herders and trained worshipers. And, and he goes out to battle and doesn't lose anybody and brings everybody back. So, so he goes out, one man with his, with his little caravan of people, goes out and defeats the kings and comes back with everything and doesn't lose anybody. So Genesis 15, 1, this is after he's met Melchizedek along the way and come back and all that. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now, this is clearly a vision. It's not a, um, it's, it's not like the other uh, sightings where, where Jesus comes and, and is there. Um, joined, you know, actually there physically. This is an actual vision. In, in scripture, if, if it's a vision, it'll say it's a vision. If it's Jesus there, it's Jesus there. OK, it does, but it, but whenever it says a vision came to me or I saw in a vision, then, you know, it's a vision. God doesn't leave. Really, he doesn't leave a whole lot of stuff up to our speculation. We just think he does, but he really doesn't. So it says after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your exceedingly great reward. Now, this is clearly a vision and not a physical appearance of the Lord speaking with Abram. In Hebrews 10, 35, it says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Paul here is speaking of persecutions and tells the church, don't cast away your, your confidence. It, you know, if, if a lot of things are worn against you and things don't look like they're going right, I mean, it's a great lesson for believers today. If it doesn't look like it's going right, don't throw away your confidence. It's got great reward. Now, this is what the Lord told Abram in that vision. Abram, I am your shield. Don't fear. The Lord is our great reward. Now, we ought to take the opportunity to dig into this a little bit. We need to examine what God's telling Abram in this vision. It coincides with, with what we're told in the New Testament. I am your shield. This is not the same Hebrew word God used to describe himself as the ever existent one to Moses. When he says, I am, it's, it's not I am, you know, it's not the I am, I am. It's not the ever existent one. He's simply telling Abraham 
or Abram, that he is his shield. Now, there, there are places after God describes himself to Moses, and when Moses says, who are you? And he says, I am that I am. That when he says that, he says, I exist that I exist. That a completely different Hebrew word than this I am. This I am, he is simply saying, I am. Um, not, I am the one that exists, who exists, but I am I'm your shield. Now, this shield that Abram is, is uh, being referred to here, this shield was a small shield a warrior would hold in one hand, maybe, you know, this big, not, not real big, it, but it, it's something to block a sword being used in battle. In Ephesians 6.16, the word used for shield is denoting a large shield. In fact, the word itself can mean door even. Uh, not just shield, but a door. So it's, it's large enough to be like a full body cover. The, the shield that he's telling Abram, hey, don't fear. I am your shield. He's telling him that I am the one when you're in the middle of a battle. And somebody's swinging their shield at you uh, and is coming in your direction. Don't worry about it. I'm your shield. So he's telling Abram, I'll block that. You know, sometimes we get into things in life. Life just comes at us. And, and the enemy, it says, will throw fiery darts at us, which is what is referred to in the, the um, put on the whole armor of God. We're, we put up the, you know, the shield of faith that's able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Well, sometimes it isn't fiery darts. You know, so, sometimes it's a full on, you know, attack, frontal attack with him wielding a, a sword in our direction. And God says, hey, I'm your shield. If there's something coming, I'm able to block it. I'm able to knock that down. I'm And, and I'm able to do that and allow you to be able to swing your sword in the other direction. God will meet that blow in the air, and, and it means we win. That, that's just the way it is. God's always going to meet our enemy that's coming after us, that's, that's attacking us. Now, it may not always feel that way. Like, there's a big difference between having a great big shield that is the size of your body out in front of you and somebody comes on the other side and, and you know, throws a spear, takes a swipe at you with a sword and you got this great big shield in front of you. It's not going to move a whole lot. If you have just a shield on the front of your arm and they're swinging and you're swinging with your sword in the other direction and, and you block it. Listen, you, you might feel some of that. But you're not going to get hurt. And that's what God's telling Abram. He said, I'm your shield. I'm going to block whatever's coming your direction. I'm, I'm going to keep it away from you. Now, your exceedingly great reward. He doesn't just say, I'm your shield. I'm going to block the attacks of the enemy. But I am also your exceedingly great reward. Now, this is a great description of who the Lord is for us. The word exceedingly in, is the Hebrew word miod, meaning vehemence or vehemently. The root comes from a word that speaks of a poker used to move coals around in a fire. You, you guys have seen a hot poker, right? It can get red hot on the end of it. it it's the picture of a hot poker. And it speaks of um, speaks to the temper. Of the reward, you know, to the to the temperament of that reward, it, it speaks to that. It's the 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 reward that the Lord has given us is it's vehement, it, it's um, it's aggressive, it's um, it's attacking. Get the point? Um, yeah, it is, and it's it's victory for us. It it is hot. And intense. So think about that. When, when he tells Abram, good point, Richard, overtakes us. When he tells uh, Abram, 
I am your exceedingly great reward. He's saying to him, listen, I, I'm an intense reward. I, I'm not just, oh, yeah, I want a prize, you know. He, he's an intense reward. Now, great does not mean big or powerful, but means to increase. To increase. So now we have a, a hot, intense increase. God is looking at a continual state of increase to you when you are his friend. The reward, that is sakar in Hebrew, meaning payment of a contract, compensation, or benefit. The payment of God's contract with Abram is him. And he is ever increasing toward us vehemently. Now, let's put that in the picture, New Testament picture. Um, because here is, is God in a vision talking to Abram and telling Abram, listen, Abram, don't fear this stuff of the world. I mean, the guy just went into a battle. He's got one, one person, him is the king of his of his group going against four kings who have already had battles already been tried abram hasn't been in anything he hasn't been in any scuffles i mean the worst case scenario that he's had he's get, he gotten a kind of a little dispute with with his his nephew um yeah it should, richard abram became one of the richest men to ever live and, and obtain the son at, at age 100. That should talk about the exceeding great reward, the vehement, hot, intense increase of this contract, the, the payment of this contract, the compensation of this contract that God makes with Abram. It is hot and intense. What well, I, I think. In Christianity, I, I think we we too often think that God is, is involved in our life passively. He wants us to be passive. You know, Christians run around with their hands folded. Oh, we're just going to get pushed around by the devil, and he's going to take us. And, you know, but thank God we're saved. We'll just take it, sit in your ticket, you know. Understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, Ed. Just because he trusted and believed. So God is, when he talks to Abram, he says, I'm your exceedingly great reward. Richard, exactly right. Little, small, and weak is our view. And, and that is the way Christianity has been treated. In, in the last, you know, 18 or 1900 years, the only time it was not that is when the disciples first came out of the room at Pentecost. And, and stumbled onto the street, and 3,000 people got saved. And they went around. Listen, the book of Acts is very clear about this. They went around turning the world upside down. They didn't do that by being meek and mild, puny, and, and having people run over the top of them all the time. Now, they weren't out being bullies. They weren't out pushing people. They weren't out like, uh, you know, Christopher Columbus did at the edge of a sword, uh, you know, bow and, and repent and, and convert. They weren't doing that. What they were doing was in the humility of Christ. They were declaring the, the dead to rise. They were declaring the, the sick to be healed. They were casting out devils, opening blind eyes. Touching the lame and the lame walked. So vehemently great was the reward on Peter that when he walked down the street, people were bringing their sick and laying it, laying them in the streets that the shadow of Peter being cast upon them, people were getting up and being healed. Now, they weren't doing that because uh, Peter had that much power. They were doing that because of the faith that they had in what Peter was preaching. Exactly, Richard, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. And it, he was bold about that when Paul and Silas were in the, uh, in the, in the prison chamber, which, by the way, was kind of like a 
damp, nasty, wet basement with rats and cockroaches, okay? Chained to a wall. What did they do? Whimpered and cowered and, you know, couldn't wait to figure out how they could get out of there? No, they began to sing songs, hymns of faith. And when they did, the place was shaken where they were at and their bonds fell off. And they, it says they walked out. Now, so powerful was that that the prison guard said, uh, the prison guard says at the end of that, I'm going to take my own life because you guys, everybody's escaped. They said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Don't do that. Get saved. Give your heart to Jesus. This Jesus we're praying about, that we've been singing about, this guy that we've been talking about, the reason why we're here in prison, give your heart to him. So the prison guard did. So the payment that God is wanting to give us is big. Take a look at what how the original Aramaic New Testament states Hebrews 11.6. Yeah, Richard, that's exactly right. He took him home with him, didn't he? Took, <laughs> took him home and the whole house got saved. His whole family got saved. Now, imagine that today in Christianity today. Imagine if we had the kind of faith like that. Or, or maybe it's just the boldness we lack. What if we had the boldness to, to just tell people and, and do what the Spirit was leading us to do? That, I mean, that's really the kind of faith that these guys had. They just, yeah, I, I can lay hands on your, your, what, your son's got a fever? Sure, I'll lay hands on him. Coronavirus, are you kidding me? Come on, yeah, come over here. Let me lay hands on, on that kid. They were fearless, but humbly fearless which made them more powerful than any of the other people, no matter how they were. The strongest Romans that kept Paul imprisoned, they would come to him at night. They would, they would sneak over to him. They would talk to him. They would, they would counsel with him because they knew he had a connection that they didn't have with the creator of the universe. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, no one can please God. For whoever is brought near to God must believe that he exists and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Now, we kind of stop it. We must believe that he exists. Well, I believe God exists. Listen, you're not going to get the, the pleasing kind of faith. The, the, the God kind of faith that he talks about, you're not going to get that just by believing that, that he exists. You have to have an expectation that he's a rewarder and diligently seek him. I mean, Jesus talks about that. He said, listen, all these things the Gentiles seek after. Your heavenly father knows that you have a need of those. He knows you need, you know, toilet paper. He knows you need gasoline. He knows you, you have a need of a house and shelter and a job. Your heavenly father knows all that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all of these things will be added unto you. And it's an interesting Greek layout there. Added unto you means heaped upon. You know what we think? We think we have one, we're going to add two, we add three. That, that's what we think added to you. That, that's not the word. That's not the language there. The, the language there is heaped upon, heaped upon. Give and it shall be given to you. How? A little bit back. No. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Running over will men give to your bosom. Overflowing, exactly. Overflowing. I'm sure Mike Kelker can tell us um, from Mexico down there because Becky has, has let the cat out of the bag a lot of times. It, I mean, they, they were down to nothing and, and just prayed. Believe God. They didn't they didn't get on the phone and, and you know, uh, do a bunch of buddy calls. They got they just prayed and they, Becky would just say, well, I believe God. It's going to happen. We're going to have what, what we need. 
Sure enough, the Lord bring it to them, you know, through somebody. The Lord always uses other people to bless other people. Now, it isn't like, you know, you, you go down to the pond and um, you stick your shovel in the ground um, and, and up comes bubbling crude. You know, it's not like that. God uses people to bless people. And when we believe and we trust him, God overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly meets our need. We have to believe, though, that he is a rewarder. Here we see in the New Testament the key that Abram had to see the Lord as he is. See, Abram saw the Lord as he is, high and lifted up. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Uh, Ezekiel saw the Lord high and lifted up. The disciples saw Jesus high and lifted up. It is said repeatedly that Abram believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Everything Abram got, he got because he believed God. Having faith or a strong belief that God is does not mean simply believing he exists but rather the totality of his existence as Abraham had. It is one thing to believe that God exists. He's just here, you know. He, he, he's just a being. Oh yeah, I believe there is a God. Well, believing there is a God is not the same as believing everything that God is. I, did you did y'all get that? It it means understanding his will and believing it. It means having an expectation that he will meet whatever it is that is in your life according to his will. See, when we understand God's will, we understand we're in his will. When we understand we're in his will, we can have an expectation of his will. This is why the and is there. We are to search after he, after who he is, which brings remuneration to us. That the word, the, the um, Greek word used for water means remunerator. Remuneration is you do something. Um, we put this on our giving statements. When we send them out. Um, where we say your gift was given without any remuneration. In other words, we didn't give you a promise. We didn't give you a, a reward. We didn't give you a return on what you gave to the church. Thank God we don't because we don't have much to give back. What we, what we do have is we have God who remunerates back to us. That's the reason why he said he's never seen the righteous forsaken nor is he begging for bread. That cast your bread upon the water, it'll return back to you. He, he doesn't say um, when he talks about a return, he doesn't say I'm going to return to you two two percent or three percent. He says 30, 60 and 100. 30, 60 and 100 fold is uh, is a percentage return. I'm going to return to you 30 percent more. I'm going to return to you 60 percent more. I'm going to return to you 100 percent more. It, but it's progressive. Progressive, the whole terminology in the Greek language when Jesus says that, that, that the Lord's going to give 30, 60, and 100 fold, it is, it is a progressive language. It, it may be 34 fold today. You, you keep hanging in there because the word keeps saying over and over and over again, it tells us that, that we are to, to continue on. We, we are to endure until the end. And just keep enduring. That word endure it, it is a word that you, you keep going. Yeah, sorry, Richard. 30-fold would be 3,000%, not 30%. Now, if we, if we think about that, we, we give whatever, time, energy, resources, we give into the kingdom. We give to what God does. And um, yeah, Ed, we are God's hands and feet on the earth. And so as we give, God is continually, 
continually replenishing what we give. So, so that as we give, and, and I'm talking about everything, time, energy, resources, the whole, the whole ball of wax. As we give, the Lord returns. We give, the Lord returns. We give, the Lord returns. And, and it's progressive, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. We're going to search after who he is because that's going to bring remuneration to us. God expects us to draw from him of our substance. God expects it. That's the reason why he said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things the Gentiles seek after, all these things, God will return it. It says, then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I shall inherit it? So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Here Abram questions God, needing confirmation that he and his heirs that he doesn't even have yet, right? Because what did God say? That I mean, we we can... We can criticize Abraham here if we want. We, we, can, we can criticize him and say, ah, come on, Abraham, you're doubting God. But no, listen to the question he says. God says it to him that I'm the Lord that brought you out. I'm going to give you all this land to inherit it. He tells him before that it's going to be an inheritance to all the generations, to all his generations after him. He doesn't have any generations after him at this point. You know, he doesn't. So he says to God, how can this be, or or how can I know that I'm going to inherit this land? That, I, that all this he, he get this he isn't questioning the inheritance here. When he's questioning God about it, is I don't have that kid yet. I he's saying to God, I know I know you can do that. I know you can give us all this. I I got that, Lord. You'll give it to us, but you got to give me the kid first. I'm not concerned about everything you're giving me. That that's already uh, yeah okay I got it. Um, you're you're going to give me that, but but I need the kid to inherit it all. Now he questions him, and he wants to know how the Lord or if the Lord's still going to do this thing, bring him the kid, not the not the the land. He knows he's got that. Man, if if we could just understand that that. Everything that Jesus promised us, all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ. If we can just lay our lay down our efforts right there. Just lay down our efforts right there. Yes, we know Jesus, you, you did all that. Now the question becomes, OK, we, we know you got that. Can you help me understand? Because right now I don't, I don't have what you're asking or I, I know I got it, but I don't have it right here. Help me with that. God, once again, goes to a sacrifice as he did with Adam and Eve. It's the spilling of blood that ratifies the promise. Here we see a type of Christ. The promise to the earth is that in Abraham's seed, all the earth will be blessed. The whole earth has this going for him. Jesus' blood was shed to ratify the promise God made to mankind for blessing. Remember what I told you at the beginning of the lesson. God's modus operandi, the way he, the way he functions, the things he does, they're always the same all the time. God does the same things over and over and over again. That's just what he does. He continually does things. And yeah, he never changes. In fact, he says that I am the Lord, the Lord God. I never change. He says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. So he never changes. God ratifies his covenants with blood. He always has. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. God made a covenant with Abram, just as he did with Adam and with Noah. Both of those guys had a sacrifice after the covenant was made. 
Jesus made a covenant with his, with his disciples and all those who would follow after them. That covenant is ratified with his own blood. Genesis 15, 7 through 18. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch. Yeah, Richard, that's exactly right. Richard made, made a comment about the covenant. Because it was ratified with the blood of Christ, perfect, a perfect blood, a perfect sacrifice, perfect blood, perfect ratification. It can never, ever be altered or made null and void. It can't, can't happen. Just like, what did God say about uh, Noah? Noah, I'm never again going to destroy the earth with water. Remember, we talked about that a few weeks back. I'm not going to destroy the earth again with water. In fact, I'll put a bow in the sky that when you see the bow, you'll know that I'm not going to destroy the earth with, with flood. All the climate crisis people, <laughs> yeah, tell them. Okay, next time it rains, look up, see the rainbow. It's not going to happen. Yeah, that is why, Ed. It's, it's certainly why. And, and, I, and I believe that all the things we see today about the destruction of mankind, I mean, from, from the coronavirus uh, freak out to, you know, the global warming freak out to the this freak out and that freak out. I mean, every other it seems like every other time we turn around, there's another freak out that's going to destroy mankind, destroy the earth. Uh, one person, I, I heard this today on the radio. There is an actual group that are super vegans, and they believe that we're all going to be destroyed by cow flatulence. No lie. No lie. And, and so they want, it, they want all the bovines to die. Over the whole earth, because if they if cows die, apparently cows pass gas a lot. <coughs> um, the, the the news media, yeah, Ed, the news media does they 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 call a lot of things, um, a lot of things that are not, and things that are they things that are not they call as if they are, um, and and maybe we have a bovine flatulence plague. But anyway, there's this whole group that believes we're all going to die because of bovine flatulence. So they're, they're wanting all the cows to die. Just stop feeding cows and then they'll all die and we won't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, it's craziness, right? Well, all of that comes out of hell. All of it does. God is not going to allow the earth to be destroyed until he remakes it. It's not going to happen otherwise. On the same day, well, let's let's go through this Genesis 15. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces that God told Abram um, when he made him this promises. Uh, when he was making the covenant, he, he says, hey, take the all those different animals and. Abram brings them in for a sacrifice. Abram then takes them and cuts them in two and, and lays them out, one on this side and one on this side. Um, on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, I believe this is a prophetic verse, speaking of Jesus going down into the pit of Hades the fire pot or smoking furnace, because that um, that word for furnace, the Hebrew word for furnace actually means a fire pot. Um, it is also used in scripture to talk about Hades, hell. And so he goes in, in the midst of the smoking furnace that passes through the covenant that is made. The lamp also passes through. Jesus is the lamp. He is the light of the world. And he shows the way to salvation to those that are in the realm of the dead. Remember what happened with Abram. It, it says that a deep sleep fell over him. Horror and great darkness. Well, there's only one place where there's horror 
in great darkness, and that's in the pit of hell. And the smoking furnace, the fire pot, passed through there. And the lamp passed through there. And Jesus is the light unto men. Jesus is the light of the world. And, and when it says here, there, there's a whole lot more that's prophetic here. We also see, the, see here a covenant being made between God and God without the input or even the promise of man. Men are frail and unable to keep their end of the covenant as needed for eternal redemption or eternal favor from the Lord as Israel later receives. Men can't keep it. it Jacob, I mean, Abram can't keep it. Yet, yeah, Richard, you're right. God, God's not afraid of the pit. And he's got complete control. So God makes a covenant with himself just as he did in Christ. When Jesus came and made a covenant, he made a covenant as a man, but as God. And, and as a man, he, he comes and he makes a covenant for men, but he's making a covenant God to God. He's, so there, there's not a, any way that this covenant can fail. The new covenant is not between us and God, but between Jesus, the God man, and God the Father. In this way, there's an assurance the covenant will never be broken by either. And like Abram, we're not just beneficiaries to the covenant. Or we're, we're just beneficiaries to the covenant when fulfilled by, by them, not by us. See, I, I can't fulfill, and neither can you. You, you can't fulfill this covenant. It's, it's just not possible. That's what the law was about. The, the whole law was about explaining to men that they can't keep the covenant. The only way we can keep the covenant that God made is in Christ. We can't go to ourselves and, and plead that we're, you know, that we're uh, perfect in the covenant. You, we can't do it because we're not. But we can go to God and say, Jesus is perfect in the covenant. Because he's redeemed me, he bought me back. I have a right to the promises of the covenant regardless of my, of my actions. Now, you do have to question if your actions are rotten, uh, if you really made a commitment to the covenant. It's just the way it is. Yeah, Richard, we are beneficiaries, and Ed, we're heirs, heirs of the covenant. Now, symbolically, Egypt is the world, and the Euphrates is the land of the garden. Now, now think about this. God tells Abram when, when he's passed out, right? He, he's gone in this great darkness. Maybe this is the first time anybody's been slain in the spirit, you know. He's down and out. And, and here's God. He, he passes through the parts of the sacrifices, which, by the way, represent sacrifices of different types. I don't have time to get in that. But it, the sacrifices all mean different things. And, and all together, this cleans up everything that we could possibly have done, these sacrifices represent, and God passes through all of them for Abram and says, hey, listen, we got it, and I'm going to give you the land from Egypt, the world, to the promise, the land of the garden, the great river, the river Euphrates, the most fertile region of the time. It, it's listed in the in the book of Genesis, in the creation. The river Euphrates is right there in the middle of the whole thing. And, and it, it was an incredible, overflowing, prosperous place. So God takes all of that and tells Abram, hey, listen, I'm going to give you that whole thing. From the world to the promise. It's all going to be yours. What, did, what does he tell us in Christ? One day, we believers are going to inherit the earth. We're going to inherit the earth, the whole thing. We're just here as custodians for right now. Uh, and, and it's, I mean, it's a fun trip. Look at Genesis 16, 7 through 13. Now, the angel of the Lord found her. This is, oh my gosh, 
I, I man, I was just like today um, when I was reading through this again, I was like, oh, I never saw this one before. This is going to freak you out a little bit. Now, the angel of the Lord found her, this is talking about Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai is maid. Where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the uh, presence of my mistress, Sarai. That's Sarah, a little bit later on. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they shall not be counted for, for multitude. Now, this is Hagar, the Egyptian, the, the concubine that Sarah grabbed and said here, uh, I can't have a son for you, apparently. So uh, come to my, into my maidservants. Hagar was somewhere along the line. The Midrash has said that um, Sarah kind of got her. Remember when Abram and, her, and um, Abram and Sarah went down to uh, to Egypt and the king wanted Sarah. You know, he, he kind of Pharaoh wanted Sarah. She's hot mama, you know, and he wanted her into his harem. Well. He, um, at that point in time, when God scares the willies out of him, he says, hey, why have you lied to me, Abram? You you didn't tell me that was your sister. Or you told me that was your sister. You didn't tell me it was your wife. I could have, you know, God was going to kill me if I didn't, if I did anything to her. Here, get out of here. And gave him a bunch of servants and, and cattle. Gave it to him. Blessed him. Get out of here. I'm going to bless you. Just get out of here. Just leave me alone so I don't die. Well, Hagar was she was one of the ones that were was assigned to Sarah in that whole thing. So she trusts her. She and she gives her over to Abram. Abram comes into her. Yeah, Richard and lots of money. Uh, and she gets pregnant with this Ishmael. Well, then Sarah gets jealous because, you know, I guess Abram's paying attention to Hagar. And she kicks Hagar out along with her son. And God says, wait a minute, that's still Abram's son. I'm going to bless him. And, and Hagar, you just did what you what you were told to do. I'm going to bless you. He says, go back. I'm going to I'm going to make this OK. But he pronounces a word over him that he's going to be a pain in the hind end to everybody. The angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are with child and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, Here I also have seen him who sees me. Now, in this account of Hagar, the Egyptian fleeing from Sarai, but receiving a visit from Yahweh, this isn't the angel of the Lord. This isn't an, an angel wings, you know. This isn't an angel. This is an appearance of Jesus to her. She recognizes him. She's not afraid of him. She doesn't go run and hide. She recognizes from, from his presence. She knows she's, she's been in Abram's house. She knows the encounters that Abram's had with him. She knows what's going on. and. Here, he appears to her. She called upon him, just as Abram taught her, just as she had seen that the members of that household done. She calls upon the Lord God of heaven. He responds to her, comes down and visits her. And this is Yahweh. This, I mean, this is Jesus. She gets a visit and resp responds to her cry for mercy. Now, this is, pro is also prophetic. For God's eventual purpose of Israel. It's also prophetic going forward. He does all that God can do, but angels cannot. That's how we know this is Jesus. Because he does everything God can do, but he doesn't, but he does things angels cannot do. He says he's going to multiply her seed. And the angel cannot multiply the seed of, of the creation. Only God can do that. Only God could prophetically speak over her 
and speaking into the future and to change the course of mankind with an increase in the seed of anybody. Angels can't do that. They don't have that kind of authority or power. Now, bear in mind, this entire prophecy has come to pass over thousands of years. We've seen this prophecy absolutely happen. He knows she's with child and will bear a son. An angel couldn't have known that unless, I mean, he might have known she was with child because she was out to here, but not that she had a son. How would an angel know that? Only God would know that because God, God allowed that child to be there. There was no way for an angel to know this. Since it is the Lord that decides our personality, the pronouncement over Ishmael could only come from the potter who has power over the clay to make the clay in his own fashion. We learn that in the New Testament. Doesn't the potter have power over the clay? He speaks that about, uh, about Pharaoh. When, you know, he says, hey, Pharaoh didn't really have a choice. He wasn't going to let the people go because I designed him and made him to not let them go. So that I had a purpose so that when Israel did get let go, they would get let go with a mighty let go and blessed abundantly way beyond what they could have ever had. And that all the earth would know that he is God. Besides that, when she addresses the being as God, the God who sees. An angel, we know this from the book of Revelation. An angel would have refused, would say, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. I'm not God. I'm not God. That's how we know this is Jesus. Because the compliment was paid. Look, look at that again, what she says. You are the God. Not a God. You are the God who sees. You see that? And when she says that, an angel, a created angel, a created being would have said, just like in the book of Revelation, hey, don't bow before me. Don't, don't call me that. I'm not him. Isn't that wild? But the purpose of God in Ishmael had to be fulfilled because Ishmael figures in through world history, Ishmael has been in the middle of the thing with Israel for millennium. And it had to be that way for Israel to move along, to be everything that God had for Israel. And in fact, it had to be that way for there to be an eventual come at the uh, coming at the end of time. When all things crash around, Ishmael has to be part of it. Some juicy, deep stuff here. The well named by Hagar is Beer Lahe Roy, meaning the well of the living one who sees me. When she, she, there's a well there. Yeah, that is the problem still today, Ed. That, that's why I said this is all prophetic. Now, now she names this well, the well of the living one who sees me. The living one is an Old Testament reference to the God of Israel given by those outside of it, Israel who had encounters with God. They called him the living one. Ishmael was a carnal choice of Abram. Now, we often make carnal choices in life that God will go ahead and bless but always to an end purpose to bring us into a stronger relationship or perhaps a more revealed relationship with himself. Ishmael to this day has been a pain in the side, the backside really of Israel, but their purpose over the generations has always been to bring Israel back to God, but always through a lot of pain because of his wildness. The prophetic word over Ishmael, listen, it, it was 100% true. Look at Genesis 17, 1 through 2. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. I will make a covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. There's that word again, exceedingly. 
Here we find Abram and Jesus again in a direct appearance as the pre pre-incarnate Christ. It's interesting that he declares that he is God. Jesus is God. This is where he tells Abram he will make him the recipient of the covenant between God and God. I am almighty God. When, when he appears to Abram, and it says the Lord appeared to Abram, because it says the Lord here, the, we have to make, and, and, and Abram didn't die immediately, as he would have if God had appeared. This is Jesus. Abram recognizes him. He's seen him lots of times already. And, and he comes and he tells him, walk before me blameless. I'm almighty God. Jesus here declares that he is God. And he says, I'm going to make my covenant between me and you. And I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. Same thing Jesus told us. Same thing Jesus told us. Look at Genesis 17, 5 through 6. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you. And kings shall come from you. Here, Jesus changes Abram's name from Abram to Abraham. You see my Hebrew there? It is the same name, but with, an, with a hey, that letter right there is a hey. He, with a hey added. The hey is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. They don't have an alphabet. They have an alphabet. And means revelation, but also grace, because five is the, is the number of grace. The fifth letter means favor, but also grace. Favor comes from a person because you have revelation regarding their character. That's supposed to be regarding, not regrading. Okay, regarding their character. Abram cannot be the father of this great nation without grace. He can't be. So God gives him grace. What he's missing all along is grace. In Genesis 17, 15 through 16, then God said to Abram, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Here we find a transformation for Sarai as well. Her name is Shin Resh Yad. That's the, the words there, or the letters there, reading right to left. Literally, consume the door with work. What had Sarah been doing? She, when she came up with Hagar, it was her work. She was operating in a carnal, carnal field. That's where she was at. She's going to consume the door, the entryway. She's going to consume it with work. It is changed to Sarah. So it, it then becomes Shin Resh He. Literally, consume the door with grace. In both cases, grace is given to change the lives of them forever. Jesus brings grace to us, giving us a new name in him. In our name has grace, Christian. So we got up. I know I flew through a lot of stuff tonight, um, but man, there's a lot here. There's a lot when we just read through the story of Abraham. You find all kinds of God's favor, and you can see Jesus' handprints all over it. Grace, 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 grace. And it gives us all hope. There's a lot of carnality in the life of Abram. But Abram isn't caring about the carnality. And neither is God. What he's caring about is, does he believe God? God fixes the carnal stuff. Ed says, I think Sarah, Sarah realized that Ishmael wasn't really her son and the mistake she made. Oh, I think so. She did. She realized the mistake. But God gave her grace. Hey, blessings to everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, man, I almost hate to leave, but we, it, it's time. 
Blessings to you all. Have a great week in Jesus' name. Listen, Sunday, we're going to have a great lesson Sunday. You want to be there. Blessings to you all. Have a great night.